Chanel Samba Baboon Force A legend What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? Seems like we are live. And we are live, yes. What's happening here? What's happening? What's good? Not much. Um Well how Gino what? Zamba. It's it's the it's the Freedom Podcast. Is, is it a Freedom Podcast, really? Well, I don't think it's the Freedom Podcast. I think I think we were talking we were talking about doing a podcast that was on the topic of freedom. But yes. I think now we're gonna just do a free podcast. That's yes, free form. I, and, and I don't think there's anything that beats free. Free is pretty good. Think of all the, the free things and how good it even sounds when you say free. You say free, free, free beer. And there's, free a lineup, beer. there's a lineup around the block. There's a lineup, beer. yes. When you say free economy. When you say free markets, it free. convinces us all that like, that's a good thing. Right. Yeah. The market's yeah, free. free economy, free. everything is everything sounds free. Um, and also when like people go to jail and they say free so and so, it always sounds good when people say that. Yeah. 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 Free. Uh, free Snowden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Free Snowden. So maybe we well, maybe you should just do a quick little intro so we we know like you know what you're up to. Yes, zero 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 one. This is podcast GNL Zamba, the Mind Over Matter podcast, and right now I'm just riffing with my friend Ben Wilkins over on my right right now. What's How going you doing? On? That would be, is is that the right or would that be the left? If someone is watching it through, well, it's your right, but it's gonna look like it's what. Well, yeah, when you're looking at it, I'm, yes. I don't know. Don't don't these screens like flip the image? I'm always confused. With yeah, that. the screens flip the image, but if the image is being flipped on the other side, how many times does it get flipped as they're receiving it? I don't know. I think they can probably read that your shirt says Waterloo, right? If you can read that my shirt says Waterloo, then that it's means not Ben Wilkins is going <laughs> to be on your right. It's going to be on my right, right? <laughs> <laughs> to the left of you, from their perspective. Yes. Mm. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers to being free. Mm. Cheers to having a free um, questions like the one I'm going to ask you next. Oh, you're just going to go free off the cuff question? Yes, just All off right. the cuff. How old were you when you first had, or where were you when you first had um, Return of the Mark? <laughs> mm. <laughs> I would have been young. Yeah. I mean, when did that song even come out? I think that song came out when I was like in secondary school or something like that yeah i would have been young but i think i don't you know i don't know because my now my record you know my record searching goes deep and my you know i i I dig i dig through lots of records but at the time when i was a kid i didn't really listen to the coolest music like it took me a little while it was in high school that i started to really get into like finding the what were you listening to when when you are in high school Um, before you became cool with okay. the catalog. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, the cool stuff was like what my parents happened to have bought on vinyl, right? So, there was like the Beatles. Yes. And they had like Joni Mitchell and Carole King. Like, some, you know, good stuff, for, good singer songwriters from the 70s. You know? Are you, are you but, saying that they aren't cool? <laughs> no, they're very cool. They're very cool. But what I'm saying is like, I remember my dad asking, you know, if I knew who Kurt Cobain was when he read in the newspaper that he committed suicide. And although I'd heard, oh wow, I, I'd heard Nirvana yeah. before. Obviously, yes. they were already on the radio. Yes, I wasn't like a huge Nirvana fan. I didn't really know. I was too young. Yeah, I was like, I don't even know how old. I was like eleven or maybe nine years old at yes. the time. You know, yes. was, so yeah. I mean, some sometimes people are completely saturated in a music scene from their childhood if they have like older siblings that are hip and whatnot. But that was not. That was not really my scene. Although I do remember, even in my like little suburban neck of the woods, which is a little part of Canada, I remember uh, people having battery operated um, discman. Dis- well, no, it was tape. It was tape decks, boom boxes, right? Oh and wow! And people would yeah. bring them down to the down to the the park, and people would try rapping over it. That was like that was actually going on. There was like there was like the basics of freestyle so rap cool. happening. Yeah. You know, when I was like in grade, it seven, was released eight. in nineteen ninety six. Ninety six. Nineteen ninety six. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, I was just starting high school. Just said, yo, that's that's really really cool. Um, wasn't that around the time when Kiss of the Rose was also out, or is it that? Is I think that, so. Yeah, 
Those those are also like high school dance numbers. Do you know right how there? old we sound right now saying songs by Seal? <laughs> yeah. It I, just made me feel old realizing that I was there or alive when Kiss of Kiss of Kiss from a Rose was did blaring you, on when radio. you were when you were growing up when you were in high school and you first got into music, did you spend a lot of time trying to catch up? Like like what were the cool songs in the eighties and what were the cool songs in the sixties and the seventies? No, did you no, no, no you didn't you were no. See, I kind of did. I kind of wanted to like get a big, a sort of a rap on it. And yes. I also yeah. studied music in college. So that like gave me more of an understanding of jazz and different things like that. But my thing is now, if you were a kid now in high school and you just woke up to music, now there's a few extra decades than even we had. Oh, yeah. You know, the, yeah. Yeah. The, the amount of songs um, that's been recorded is incredible. That, that's why I don't get this whole notion where people like who are born in the sixties are like, "Oh, our music is much cooler than yours." Yes, they, they they have like the nostalgia attached to it, and the, and the moments when they were children. Mm. But I don't really think it was that cool because they only had like how many sen- how many decades did they have to compare to like recorded music to what we have right now? I don't know. I disagree. I think it was pretty cool, and I think in a lot of ways it was cool. Uh, like, okay, so in here and. Let me try to explain it. Yeah. Okay. I feel like the '60s in America and Canada that was like in, you know, probably in the whole Western world. Yeah. I don't know what it was going on in the '60s in Uganda, but in the '60s, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, there was, I, I just there was drew a picture, yeah. the first time ever where more people moved from cities to the countryside to try to start experimental communities. Millions of people did that. Oh, there was a lot of cultural change that was profound, right? Like the youth didn't want to go to Vietnam; they didn't like that. There was this. Oh, there was the civil rights movement mm-hmm, and feminism, mm-hmm, and there was mm-hmm. all these like very important things that all culminated in this sort of youth rebellion that was a throw off of conventions. That was let's 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 figure out all the all the stigmas associated with sex and have free sex now, and let's try all the drugs. And there was like this sort of idea of. We can figure out a new way of living and a new way of being. And the music reflected that a lot of the time. And, and I totally agree. And you just blew my mind, actually. You just explained something uh, which explains a little town where we went over the weekend. Mm. The place that you're talking about, that you're describing where the youth might have left like in the 60s or early 70s to just go to form communities, mm. it has the vibe of that that, that um place that you're describing of the 60s of hippie we don't want to go fight a war we just want to form our own culture smoke a few a few drugs and you know live life and listen to music you know yeah well, try, and yeah try and experimental things did you see that film uh, wild wild country i didn't see wild wild country i'm yeah. i'm still catching on, on to so many things so, to, so many things it's about so, american culture yeah. which makes my life like really um I think it's really dope because for a while I was so acclimatized to uh, um, to British culture. Okay. But now it looks like a whole window is opening up to like North American culture. I knew a little bit, but it's not as wide. But going back to my point of what which we're talking about of if 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 your record collection right yeah. has all these cool artists right yeah you have the Johnny Mitchells you have. The Beatles, you have um, the Bee Gees, and you know who was the coolest of of all. You have what's his name, the guitar god, Jimi Hendrix. You have yeah. Jimi Hendrix. It's still not going to be as deep. It's not going to be as huge as a discography if you go to the era of like um, James Brown, Chaka Khan, and Let Town Motown. Yeah. You get me? Because yeah. that's us. We have like, that would, that would be like two more generations collecting music. Right. So when they say, oh, we had the coolest music, it isn't like they had been listening to recorded music from like the 1800s. There was no recorded music. Right. So the time, the time of uh, music that they have is, um, I should say like 40s, right? When did the vinyl get invented? I think it was a while before, but 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 when people actually, I think when records started to be more ubiquitous, where people had that a lot, you know, yes. in the fifties, people were always buying these little seven-inch vinyls, right? Yes, and that's one of the reasons the songs at the time had to be about three minutes long, because that's about how long you could fit a song on on that size vinyl. If you yeah. if a song was longer, the vinyl would be crammed together smaller, and it, it wouldn't sound very good. You know the grooves need to be spaced out enough for you to get all the bass and 
and all that stuff. So yeah, fifties, sixties, you know, and then I think the seventies. So, so got, sh- should we should we brag that um, we have better sound quality? Well, I was just going to get to that. So, yeah. like the seventies, I feel like was this interesting combination where all of the experimentation and the mixing of genres was happening pretty intensely, but mm-hmm. also the recording technology really went leaps and bounds. And the the if you put on a record from like you know an Atlantic Records album from seventy three or seventy four. Those records sound amazing, you know. The Aretha Franklin albums. There's one called "Hey Now Hey," the other side of the sky, produced by Quincy Jones. Recorded oh, yeah. in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Yeah, what's up, Quincy? What's up, Quincy? <laughs> we know you're listening. We know you're watching. <laughs> what's up, Q? What's up, Q? <laughs> uh, shout out to Q. Yeah, shout out to Q. <laughs> shout out to our homie Q. That those records just sound impeccable. They breathe. They don't get old. I never yeah. get tired of listening to that. Yeah, you know. I remember listening to a joint, um, and I don't know if it's from the vinyl era. I don't know. I don't know if it's from the CD era. I have to have to, um, to make sure when I research. But it's a joint which I think is one of the most well mixed joints. You might disagree, but I remember listening this to this in Uganda and being like, "Wow, this sounds like well mastered." Mm. You know that joint called "It's My House." It just has this chick sing, "It's yeah. My House," and I live here. Yeah, yeah. Who, who sang that? I don't know. Let's look this up. Yeah, let's look this up. Yeah, I'll be interested to see who produced that too. Yeah. Uh, so, you, um, which is the other song we're talking about where we felt um, the quality was really good? Was this a Chaka Khan song that you usually like? Well, Chaka Khan's awesome. Yeah, yeah. She's going to come to the Hollywood Bowl this summer. Are you going to get tickets? I think I might go check her out. I'm yeah, Michael I'm McDonald and Chaka Khan. That'll be good. It surprised me that someone who knew um, Diana Ross... Yeah, and I'm not putting anybody on blast, but my father-in-law uh-huh. uh, loves Diana Ross to like beats, but he didn't know who Chaka Khan was. Interesting, isn't that the same era, or am I mistaken? Uh, I would say Chaka Khan was a little later, I think. Also, Diana Ross had this whole diva thing first on Columbia Records, right? She yeah. was she was kind of seen as this as this sort of queen, you know, and then actually her album that kind of did really well. Yeah. Um, which had I'm coming out on it. Yes. And um had Upside Down. Are, on are it. you coming out? That ben? was the first <laughs> 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 that was the first album that she did with Nile wow. Rogers. And when they submitted it to the record label, they didn't like it. They didn't like I'm coming out. That they had the Are you kidding me? Yeah, they didn't get it. They were like, What what is that? And Niall, you know, Niall Rogers, the producer, was like, yes. This is her you know, this is her fanfare. This is the Are you talking the, about Neil royalty? Are you talking about Neil the, just uh the dreadlock dude, the yeah, guitar guy? Nile Rogers, yeah, yeah, yeah. He he was sort of like he produced all so many artists' best selling records. Yeah. And wrote a lot he wrote so he wrote those songs. He went for he took Diana Ross out when he was going to produce a record. He took her out in New York City, and she and he was like, "So you know what, what's uh, you know what's life like?" He just wanted to before he was writing with her, he wanted to get to know her, and he said like, "You know how, how's how's life? What's going on?" She Man. said, "Oh, you know, I just moved to New York City, and everything's so different. I feel like my whole life is upside down right now." <laughs> and then he went home and wrote "Upside Down." Oh, you're kidding me. No. And guess who wrote uh, the song that I was talking about? Who I didn't know who... I didn't, I didn't know who, who... It's My House? Who wrote it's that? My House. I don't know who wrote it, but the person who sang it was Diana Ross. Oh, so there I did, you go. I did, in Africa, I didn't even know who Diana Ross was. I only knew Diana Ross from as being that woman who was who's Michael not Jackson's Khan. friend. Who, yeah, who's not Chaka <laughs> Khan, who's Michael Jackson's friend. Right. Yes. Um, yeah, so catching up on American culture and what you've just been talking about, um, upside down, like going through that experience of writing a song. Yeah. You've just moved to a city where you're writing songs from experience. Mm-hmm. Do you think our music in this generation is kind of lacking that experience where it's just a collection of other people and trying to manufacture a hit rather than writing one person's experience? Well, so living in L.A., which is kind of, you know, a a, uh, entertainment city, right? There's a lot of money in entertainment. There's a lot of people that are seeking that out. I would say there's certainly a part of the industry here that's trying to be that hit factory. That's just kind of trying to find whatever is that lightning in a bottle, grab it and and just make records like that. Yeah. So whatever the, find the formula for success, write songs like that, sell the songs, get paid, buy your big house. That's kind of, that's sort of, 
motiv- that motivates a lot of people. That's kind of seems like a path forward that makes a lot of sense. Whereas other artists in other cities, and not like there's not lots of you know, artists that aren't doing that in LA. There's lots of people that are just doing their own thing. Mm-hmm. But th- um, the, des- the machine that's here, which is advantageous in some ways, also kind of colors a little bit the, the, the process. So yeah. a lot of times people are writing and they're not, they're just writing sort of with the end result in mind. They're not yes. necessarily writing from the heart. Um, or uh, I'm also seeing, oh, uh, our producer is holding up oh, something. It was, Let's see. Oh, In My House was written by Ashford and Simpson? No way. I don't even know who that is. You don't know who Ashford no, and Simpson that's, is? That sounds familiar, but I don't think I know who that is. Well, they, okay, so they wrote lots of Diana Ross records. Okay. They were a songwriting team. They're great. So this is a great are they, story. Are they, um, were they Motown? They were, um, so, so Valerie Simpson was like the organ player at her church in Harlem. Okay. And um, Nick Ashford was this the guy, I think he was from Ohio or Michigan or something. And he hitchhiked to, you know, in this, I think it was the 60s, to New York City to try to be a dancer. Okay. This yeah. Is, and I think he had five dollars in his pocket. And oh within, wow. Within two weeks, you know, a few hot dogs later, he was sleeping on a park bench in Central Park, and he was told. Someone said, "Hey man, if you, you know, you can get a free lunch on Sunday if you come to this church up in Harlem." So he said, "No way, that's cool." And like and he's like, "Yeah, it's good food, you know." Yeah. So they went up there, and he met Valerie Simpson, who's I think her father was the pastor, or her, or at least she was, you know, playing the music, and. They, you know, I think they took a liking to each other right away. And, but then eventually she, um, she, she got asked to write songs or something. And he, you know, he said he'd help out with lyrics. Yeah. So they got together and they wrote, they wrote, let's go get stoned. That was one of the first songs they wrote together, which became, that's a good idea. A huge hit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> then they wrote, ain't no mountain high enough. And that's one of my best joints. That's an amazing song. Yeah. Right. So then they had this amazing relationship where they were just writing like nonstop, beautiful stuff. Yeah, she was all music and he was all lyrics. Did, were they a couple? They weren't yet. So, th- th- so okay. they did that for a couple years, and then I think they were at some award show or something, uh, and they, you know, they were being held as, you know, honored as great songwriters, and they were there, and they had, they did a slow dance together, and then they both felt this the, chemistry the, for each other. Oh from my that God. one slow dance. My, my, my mind is so bad. My mind is so bad for every line. I feel like you're setting me up for, <laughs> for a dirty joke. <laughs> you know, like, like they're dancing so close and then you felt the boner or but you said something else. Like, <laughs> yeah. like that song Next? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Song by Next. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, then they, then they ended up um, being married and they grew and then they wrote, they, you know, they wrote, for example, the Shaka Khan song, I'm yeah. Every Woman. That was written by Ashford and Simpson. And are you telling me Nick two people? Ash- are you to tell me two people wrote the music for all the generations? Yeah, they wrote for like probably two, three generations. But it's interesting, you know. Nick Ashford wrote the lyrics to "I'm Every Woman." It's a guy that wrote the lyrics to "I'm Every Woman." Yeah, that's funny. But it takes a man to know a woman, right? I think so. That's a very interesting stop- topic. Um, I, I, I would like to delve deeper into who these two personalities are. And um, t- speaking about you when you're writing music, uh, what, 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 what's your ingredient from writing a song like the album like All From Hello? What was your mindset thinking about that? It's all different stuff. I would say each song kind of comes from its own place, mm-hmm. right? And um, usually, usually for me, if I'm sitting at the piano, it's going to come from the harmony. I'm going to start playing some chords. I'm going to mm-hmm. start to kind of create a little bit of a world. And then I'm going to hear a melody in that. And I'm going to figure out, I'm going to sing that melody. And then I'm going to, you know, if I like it, then I'm going to try to figure out what that melody is saying. You know, mm-hmm. what would the singer of this song be saying? Kind of so sometimes you, so you could start, a little bit. You, you could start off like singing like, the beaches. Yeah. Well, whatever <laughs> the melody might be, I might <laughs> sing it, right? But then you, you try to find words that fit in that. When a lot of the time, I don't know until I've gotten to the chorus what the song is going to be about yes. or anything, you know? Yeah. Okay, before I get nailed for not knowing who all these amazing writers are from American culture, maybe I need to introduce myself to the people that I wasn't born in this country. I'm just getting to catch up on the amazing music that has happened in the U.S. I'm getting to catch on to so many other different cultures in, um, in the U.S., New York culture being different from L.A. culture. Um, I think everything is just amazing, and to me it's, it feels like I'm, I'm finding a treasure, a treasure chest 
in every on every sand beach that I find. So it could be music this time, it could be a history book, it could be literature, it could be um, whether we are olive oil testing, uh, like we did, we did, I went for uh, my first year anniversary in Ojai, the place I was talking about earlier, that's, that looks like that 70s joint where people just left the city and rebelled or went to hide and form their own thing out of rebellion. Yeah. Ojai has that kind of vibe. Um, cool. And it was really fine. So me discovering all these things is um is is dope. And that's one of the things that I would like to rediscover and delve into as many subjects as many subjects as we can. Nice. Well talking about um if I can just go back to talking about music creation and yeah. kind of what got us into into music in the first place. Can mm-hmm. I can I ask you a little more about when you first really got into it and really when you first decided like yeah, you know, I really want to make music. You know, when did you first decide that, like, not only did you love it? Well, first, yeah. when did you decide you loved it? And then when did you decide that, like, I need to make this too? Um, I think I think the the point of loving... To, to me, the lyrics came first before I even, like, really realized that I love music a lot. Mm. But I grew up in a house where my dad collected records. Mm. And he had, like, cassettes and he had... A few vinyl records, not so many, but he played them over and over again, so that they cassette became cassette tapes. Yeah, like cassette tapes. Okay. Yeah, and he had like a, some some of them were like double, where they used to like pack both of the uh, the eight tracks. I don't know if they're called eight tracks. Oh. I don't even know if that's what they are called, but they are like you have like a deck where you have like one on one side and then one on one side, oh. and then one side could be like cassette one, cassette two, and then he had like a collection of those from like Ministry of Sound. Okay. Yeah, some shit like that. And yeah. We also had, um, so he used to play a lot of like um, mu- music from South Africa, please play music from Congo oh, and cool. music from Uganda as well pl- uh, with a mixture of whichever German band was trendy or whichever UK band was trendy, but not as many American acts like got through. I think the only person I ever had in my house was uh, either James Brown or a Madonna or something like that. Something, okay. Yeah. So it wasn't like um, he was out there listening to um, who, who, who would be. The Beatles were not in my house when I was growing up, but there was a Bob Marley. But there's yeah. also, you're saying, so, the, so your dad was collecting records from different places in Africa mm-hmm. as well as bringing, bringing in you know, stuff from other, other places in the world. And it wasn't like he was collecting them. It was just um, probably from whichever store that he used to go to that had a record. Right. And you just buy it and put it, make it part of his collection. My dad never really traveled that much. Right. But I guess he traveled through his love for television and his love for music. So when we were growing up, we had Eli Wamala, Ophili Bongo, Little Taya, Eklas, Kawalia, um, Chaka Chaka. Oh, we had some Congolese, amazing Congolese music, music um, by uh, a guy called Franco. So like you're going through like seventies funk. There was a little bit of seventies funk. I might not even remember what the names of the artists of who the artists were, but there was a period of funk of like a James Brown. Cool. And like all of them are obsessed with that kind of sound. And from that you have like Congolese and then you have South African and a mixture of like Ugandan and probably something like Do you ever did you ever see the band called Bonnie M? No. Oh my god. So they're like from that seventies era, and every African house has a CD <laughs> oh, yeah. or a tape, and they're like so popular. Bonnie M. Bonnie M. Yeah, have to check them out. Yeah, they had a song called Ra Rasputin, something like that. What was your sound system like? Was it like big speakers, like in the eighties, that were like really popular? Or was it? Yeah, some of those wooden joints. Like it was like a speaker. It was like, like a piece of furniture. Right? Yeah, it's like a piece of furniture, and you you couldn't actually move it. You know. <laughs> yeah. To move it would actually require some work. But the, the sound was really good and clear. Nice. And it was like a taboo. There was like some records, the vinyls don't even touch those. You must mess them up. That's dad's collection. You know? Oh, yeah. And then you can mess with the tapes as much as you want to. So a lot of music in your house growing up. A lot of, mu- yeah, a lot of music in my house you growing up. You were dancing and, a lot too? And also it? my sister, um, my, my young sisters, I remember them dancing to Greece like on repeat. Okay. Yeah, so... I think I know most of the songs on the Grease soundtrack. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nice. So that's that's my introduction to music. But I should say, 
when I began like this, this discovering my journey to music, it was through uh, understanding poetry and trying to read American lyrics in hip hop and trying to figure out what a, what the fuck are they saying? Right. Why are they speaking too fast? Right. I'm trying to figure out what they're saying. I understand right. the vibe, I understand the flow, but what is this actually saying? So this would have been like w- when you were in high school? This been... is like beginning of high school. This is so when... you could already speak English at this point, Yes, right? this is yeah. when Nas is a thing. And, right. And Nas, already Illmatic is a thing, but I think I caught on to hip-hop during the time of I Am. That is like 1999. Okay. Where there's like a DMX, there's a Nas, there's a Jay Z, there's Wu Tang. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out what is Wu Tang saying. And I used to go to a cafe, a very slow cafe, very poor internet, uh, pay around 200 shillings. That doesn't even make a dollar. It's like in cents, right? Yeah, yeah. But with the slowest internet in the world, right? <laughs> and I used to print out lyrics, lyrics of Basta Rhymes or a Nas. And I used to just read them and try to figure out what they're saying. Was it like a web crawler back then, or was it Yahoo? What? It was. It was. Mo, it was a Mozilla. Mozilla. Still, it was a Mozilla. Mozilla. You open up like a Mozilla, and uh, you have A to Z lyrics. That's the website oh, that yeah. we used to go to, and you print them out and you read them. And you just. I used to get transported by Nas. Actually, he began describing New York City, where in my mind I began drawing pictures of what that place looked like. Oh, that's cool. So, and he was so descriptive and so poetic, and. Because I dug so much into the lyrics, whenever other people would try to do karaoke in front of me, I knew everything they were saying. Right. So I remember the same exact moment where someone chal- someone was doing a Nas. I know it wasn't a Nas song. It was Gangsters Paradise by Coolio. And I think it was a soundtrack that that was of a movie which was like popular. And he was butchering the lyrics and I was like kind of hard. So I was in the back like heckling. <laughs> I'm like, get the f- off. Yeah. That's not what they say. And it's like, he's trying to say them according to what he hears. Yeah, right. Like phonetically spelling it out. And yeah. I'm like so pissed at the back of the hall that I disrupt his performance and he gets off and comes to the back and he says, you go sing what the fuck. If you, if, if you think you know better than go sing. So I go up there. Oh Yeah. And I kill it. And for the very first time, I had an experience of performing in front of a crowd. But naturally, I wasn't a performer. Wow. But so this was like heckler turned performer exactly. in one quick 180. In one quick 180. That was me. And but GNL Zamba was born. No, not really. But that, that's <laughs> the very first seed that produced the tree that is GNL Zamba That's right cool. Now. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I never heard that story. Do you, do you have the same exact experience? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The exact same thing. I was uh <laughs> was hanging out in Uganda. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> trying to figure out what Nas was saying. Yeah. No, I think um I grew up kind of playing music from a pretty young age. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was I grew up in church, going to church a lot and singing and playing instruments was a big part of that. And then in high school, I mean I was I was Piano was one of my first instruments, but I was always singing. And then I learned guitar and I played trumpet and anything I could get my hands on. That's my favorite practice. instrument for anybody who's listening. That's my favorite instrument. I don't play, but that's my favorite the instrument. The trumpet? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just love the sound and the feel that trumpets give songs. Yeah. Uh, part of the reasons why, oh, Fela was huge in my house. My dad loved listening to Fela. Mm. And part of the... Um, the aesthetic of high life, which is Ghanaian, Nigerian music, is the beauty of the trumpets in the music. It makes everything feel triumphant. Mm. Yeah, so, so go on. I didn't mean to... Part, to uh, no, I didn't really have much more to say. Yeah. W- uh, do you know that... Have you ever watched like old Jesus movies? Have I watched old Jesus movies? Like old Jesus movies or like old movies about like, like Rome or something like, like that? Like Ben-Hur? Like you mean like um, old like Charlton Heston like is Ben had the one about the horses and the guys like riding around the yeah, chariot yeah yeah but I don't I don't remember that one having like right having like a like a monumental epic feel where the trumpet comes in you know like those I'm talking about the movies where the Caesar enters the Colosseum right oh, and everybody like stands the fuck up and the, the trumpets blow in this direction and also blow in this direction like in Bugs Bunny. I haven't seen Bugs Bunny do that. Come on. No, there's a Bugs Bunny Roman one where he does that. 
Uh, no, no, no. So I, you didn't watch I, Bugs Bunny growing up so much? I, no, guess, I huh? did watch Bugs Bunny growing up, but I wasn't a fan. I was more of a fan of Tom and Jerry. Oh, okay. Tom and Jerry was more like my joint and Punky Brewster. Okay. Yeah, but I'm talking about like those monumental, like epic joints where they're like, and then they have like, yeah. It's like gives it a very epic feel. So that's the feel I'm kind of looking for in trumpets. Right. And then even besides that, there is the way that they harmonize joints and give them a feel of, um, who is this American trumpeteer that I'm listening to right now? Uh, the name will come to me. The name will Winter come to Marcellus? me. Winter Marcellus? No, 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 no. No, no? No. Give me a 50s guy, trumpeteer. Miles Davis? Miles Davis. There you go. It's like, it's a language in its own, you know? Like, yeah. when he's playing the horn, it's a language in its own. It's like really beautiful. He was a wild guy. Yeah. What a crazy... I mean, you, you know about this period of his life where he would, he would turn his back to the audience when he performed? <laughs> no. <laughs> and yeah, mo- he, was he mourning them? No, he just got, I think he got, he, I mean, he had a wild life, right? He, he, he was beaten up by cops at one point when he was outside of a, a club. The cops came by isn't and that said, a right, so, Isn't that a rite of passage for most musicians? Yeah, maybe? but this was like very specific. Like he they was, targeted him. Yeah, he was, a, he was at night and he was a black guy outside of a club. And he was like, I work here. And they were like, no, you don't. And they beat him up. And they broke his jaw, and he couldn't play for a while. Shit. And it, after that, he got, a, you know, he got, you could, you could feel that in his music. He got darker as a person a little bit. But there was a point where, um, yeah, he, while he was performing, he would turn his back to the audience, and it was sort of this thing like, "I'm not a monkey to dance for you. Yeah. This is not a show. Yes, right. I, this, I'm doing this for me. Yes, and you're paying to watch me do it. <laughs> you know, it was kind of, it was an interesting yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah, you know? yeah. and. I find that very, very interesting. So it was this form of protest? Uh, kind of. I mean, I'm, sh- I'm sure there's a whole lot more written about it. But um, from, what I, from what I gather, he, he, you know, his agents didn't want him to do that. Nobody wanted him to do that. But of he was, course, he I wouldn't want to like, come. Yeah. It was this whole idea of like, come to hear me. Don't yeah. come to see me. I'm going to speak through my horn. Interesting. And you, you're welcome to buy a ticket and sit in the room with me. But I'm not gonna like make faces for you. Yes. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna dance and like make eye. Call. It's not. A, I it's love not that. A show. I love that. I love. I love the beauty. I love the beauty of that. And and I think it was like, um, that talented to be even to able to pull it off. Oh yeah. Like he's the kind of guy. I don't think I need to even see him perform. You just need to hear it. And that's one of the things where our music kind of like lacks, lacks a bit of that because nowadays people demand the visual and they don't listen to the music that much in they don't I, I, they don't intently listen to music anymore right it's more of how many visuals can i get and get visually stimulated and it's like the music needs aids but i don't think the music needs aids if a person is that talented yeah so i mean i think it's it's also important to put it in the context of what kind of you know what jazz seemed like to a lot of people right there was the big band era and there was like the swing music scene mm. right so in those jazz clubs you know in the in the 50s so big band era is like 1930s yeah th- i mean 30s 40s 50s was like i mean 30s is probably more just straight swing but yeah the big they got you know there was there was touring bands that would have you know black musicians playing mm-hmm. them and they would play for white audiences but you know everyone was dressed very well and yes like, there was this sort of way of presenting like louis armstrong was like one of the one of the oh like, yes you know he I was an amazing trees are green yeah and he was sort of like he was the guy who was kind of a good spokesperson because he played the game you know yes. he was smiley and goofy and yes. he, would, he would be good on the talk shows right and he kind of like bridged the gap a little bit but yes. but then there was this other scene that was happening you know with, with bebop and jazz when it started to become more artistic mm. where you know the jazz clubs they would play their swing gigs you know, they would play their gigs in the bar, but then they'd go to another club after. That would be yes. the after hours club. Oh, and be as a, in, this is what we do for the audience that pays the high money yeah. for the white audience, but this is what we do for, the, for, for us. For, for us. Yeah. Yes, and, yes. And there would be signs in those clubs that would say, no dancing, please. Like, this oh. is art. This yes. is art that's supposed to be taken seriously. It's supposed mm-hmm. to be listened to deeply. And yes. you're supposed to pay attention to these artists. Yes. So that, I think that was Miles Davis's back to the audience thing was sort of like a further you know, demonstration of that. Like, this is art. Yeah. This is not entertainment. Yes. You know, because I think enter- the entertainment box that a lot of those musicians had been put in felt a little bit 
like it felt a little bit uh, degrading, you know. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, which which is the song? Uh, there's a song that I love. Um, it's one of the most groundbreaking, I think, artists. I think it's Sammy Davis Jr. Do you, do you know that song, Mr. Bojangos? No. It's like a song done by, he was the black guy in the Rat Pack. Okay. And he's like a very, very talented guy, but from watching how his manner was and I think he endured so many things in order to be able to play in some of the places that the Rat Pack was playing in. And I could tell that he was doing it to either feed his family and also break ground for so many other black act, black entertainers coming through. Yeah. But I could tell that some of the things that he was doing to me would be, and I don't mean to disrespect his legacy at all, yeah. because who knows what he went through to be able to break the ground for maybe a new act right now to shine on a stage. Um, but to me, it sounded like you... It's clownish a bit, you know. Mm. It's it's the, it's it goes into more of that era of like Mistro Show, and it's it's more on the edge of that, you know. Much yeah. as he was a very very talented um, artist, and I love Mr. Bojangles as a song. I actually find it very very sad. If you have some time, go go and listen to that. But yeah, I I will respect the perspective that he took of. I'm not going to play for you while facing you. You're going to look at my ass. <laughs> well, you're going to look at my ass as you listen to to uh, the music. Um, and I think music is a gift from the gods. Yeah, I really feel music is a gift from the gods. I've been writing, I've been writing some poetry, and I came to the conclusion that sound is the thing that controls everything. There's a secret behind sound that controls everything, which is like really central to us as humans, that we haven't even studied that deeply. Or if we have studied that deeply, we have observed them, we have observed things and just taken them for granted. Mm. And the way music tunes human emotion, like you could just listen to a sad song and it, you could feel like you relate to the person who wrote that song or the moment that wrote that song. Right. And it could uplift you. You could listen to a song and you're like, I'm feeling down. Da, da, da. You feel like some kind of camaraderie in some songs. You feel the music has a soul. Yes. Uh, a friend of mine who's a great artist, who's also a visual artist yeah. and a musician. Yeah. And one time she said it in this way that I thought was interesting. She said, visual art is, you know, kind of about making a statement whereas music is about capturing a moment interesting. I, thought that was, I thought that was kind of interesting yeah hit me baby one more time <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a moment that's, that's a, a moment <laughs> right there like i yo uh, um i i know right now uh, on on our team somebody is a britney spears fan and on your team on on the team yes on so, our team on, on our, our team, team right? on our team Right there, she's a Britney Spears fan that went to Vegas to pay homage oh, wow. to her favorite artist. And my, oh, I, I I need to go back to a point that we made earlier that I have to disagree, yes, disagree please. on. But let me first make this point first. Um, she drove to Vegas to celebrate one of her birthdays, and the request was she was going to go and let Britney Spears hit it just one more time. And to her, it represented the era of her coming to coming of age and having moved to Los Angeles to start making a life for herself. So capturing an era and capturing a moment, much as people would like to make fun of Britney Spears' music, that captured the moment for so many people, so sure. many teenagers in the U.S. Absolutely. Who is your Britney Spears? Britney Spears. It's definitely my Britney Spears. <laughs> <laughs> hail the queen. Oh, hail the queen, Britney. One thing that amuses me is how America will never allow Britney Spears to fail. America. No matter how many times she fucks up, she's a darling. Oh, I think they made. I think they 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 delighted in in her meltdown. You know that was a lot. They sold a lot of newspapers when when you know the pressure. Yeah. Made her fail. I, I'm not sure. I agree with that. But um, just because, just like kind of anyone who, like for Michael Jackson, for example, rose yes. to such an incredible stardom. As soon as, or even you know, Bieber now, 
the paparazzi follow around follow this guy around like it crazy, it could drive you, you know? crazy yes. yeah so yes. you know if uh, i relate i relate i've been followed by i'm playing i'm playing <laughs> <laughs> But I understand the whole bit of how American paparazzi could drive somebody crazy. Right, right. Yeah, you're speaking about your Britney Spears. Yeah. <laughs> what do you, what do you, our our Britney Spears? Uh, our Britney Spears. <laughs> we're thinking about we're, we're speaking about our Britney Spears. No, but uh, I don't, I don't I want to get you back to uh, disagreeing with me because uh, oh yeah, let me in yes this, thank, in this you, podcast, thank you thank we're you so speaking much freely and um yes and, and it's it's good when we have disagreements friendly it's disagreements. very good yeah my disagreement is when people like you said before when you were referring to uh, Los Angeles that the machine here is a machine that pumps out local music. And it's a ver- it, 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 that pops up pop music, yeah, or you know, commercially it, successful, commercially art. successful yeah. art. But I would like to disagree um, that that's a statement that needs to be updated, in a way. Okay. Because it's, updated. Let's let's update it because there's this thing of um, even when you see people like on the East Coast and they're talking about Los Angeles, they say, "Oh, Los Angeles is that place called Oh Holy Weird and in Kenya, everybody's buying friendship and the place is nice and real." But uh, some of these things need to be updated because there were things that used to apply to LA. I think in a later time you could disagree, but this is where I disagree with okay, you. Okay, let me hear it. In LA is the only place where you find going to find. All sorts of music, the diversity in this one city, when it comes to genres of music, that the people who look down on pop music are much more than the people who are making pop music in LA. Would you agree? Um, uh, I don't know if I agree that the. I, you know what? I haven't taken a, a wide enough but poll. But the fact that you can think about it for that long. You're right. That hesitation does mean that we might need to update that. We yeah. need to update this. Yeah. LA has given us people like Anderson Park. Right. Well, is the, he from LA though? He's, yeah. he's from Oxnard, I think. To me, that's LA. That's California. That's a huge. Hey, that's a, Ventura County, LA. baby. That's a different county. That's an <laughs> hour and a half away. That's how, that's right? That's true. His first album is Venice. Yeah. Then he goes then, to Malibu, then he goes to Ventura, but he's from Oxnard. Yeah, yeah. You know, like LA has given us. There are people. The, right now, there are places where you can go to and you listen to Florence and the Machine. Yeah, and that crowd will never be caught uh, two miles of a venue where a bubblegum pop artist is playing. Right, right. You get me. Much as that is going on, and this is the place for it, and there's so many teenage girls here. There are so many pockets where you could just go listen to um, artists who just pluck their guitars, and that's the genre. I completely agree with you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it needs to be updated. Yeah, for sure it needs to be updated. I would just say the all, the difference between like that's going on in every city, I think. You yeah. know, it's probably going on more here. There's a lot of artists and creative people that move here cuz you know, those you know, those kinds of people attract each other to different little different centers. So mm-hmm. urban areas have a lot of that. But there's different communities tucked away all over the place. Um I think I I think because LA also has the commercial thing, there's yeah. a lot of people that are that are here that are not really pursuing their own artistic goals, but they're really just there to, to try to get team. money. Yeah, to yeah. get famous. You know, <laughs> so th- so I agree with you that that's less than the majority. Most yes. people, there's probably much more good stuff going on, and 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 even people that are doing that, that are doing it with you know with integrity and yeah. and good artistic intent and all that, and craftsmanship. And because yeah, so, uh, so when I listen to uh, your album, yeah. I don't see you trying to chase money because that's not. <laughs> You get me, but you're yeah, here in LA. You, and when you look at me as a person, Are you trying I'm to get the obviously bag. Obviously, <laughs> not trying to chase money. <laughs> yeah, and when I look at like uh, the music that we do, we know the money is there. We know the pockets with the money, yeah. but we do music and hope that other people of our tribe can can relate to that and uh, and can can consu- can consume that. And right. we have been to shows which are like, this is so out of the pocket. I even never knew it existed. Right. Yet the general feel of LA, and when you hear people talking about it, is this is kept kept. We are. This is where the kept up is, and this is everybody. Uh somebody's trying to reach out to me right now. He's but, a. I don't think that got on the recording. Yeah. It didn't. Okay. Uh, but this is more like um, everybody thinks that we are still in the NSYNC era, and everybody's boy band when you're talking about LA and. The scene of music here, right? But they don't know their albums that are like 
there's a young Amy Winehouse like in a bar oh, right yeah. now trying to make it in no, LA, totally, you know? Totally. Yeah. No, you're right. You're absolutely right about that. And I would say that when I go and hear live music, you know, which is going on all over the city, you know, you can walk into just about any venue and the level of the artistry is really high. Yeah. You know, people are doing working really hard and 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 making great great songs and yeah. and working hard on their shows. That's absolutely. Yeah. Great, that was a great update. That, that yeah, was a great yeah, update yeah. to we, my we otherwise should, we misconception. We should update all these things, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so you're listening to the Zambaland podcast, Mind Over Matter. I'm with my very good friend, Ben Wilkins, my swimming instructor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm GNL Zamba, originally from Uganda right now. We're both in Los Angeles, originally from Canada. That's right. Is that Montreal? Well, I was in Montreal for 10 years, so I often hail from Montreal. But I was actually born in Toronto and yes. then grew up in London, Ontario. London, Ontario. Where would you rather live? If there were two options, uh, Montreal or Toronto, which one would it be? I would have to say Montreal. For those who don't know, Montreal is where the snobs go, the, the wine snobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit of that. I mean, Montreal, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a very special place. Yeah. Um, I'm glad, I, I'm glad I, uh, I, got, I got, had the privilege of living there for a little while. Yeah. Um, it's a really interesting place. It's frustrating in some ways, for yes. sure. You yes. know, there's, there's definitely parts of it I don't miss. But um, it's, it's a very artistic, um, you know, f- pretty free kind of city. You can, yeah. sort of, you can fly your freak flag there. You can do what you want to do. Why, why do Canadian artists prosper more than u.s artists if i could make such a statement why do they prosper in the u.s more than even um u.s artists and why is everybody trying to cross the, the border down do, do we need to build a wall <laughs> <laughs> to keep justin bieber out and to celine keep the dion Canadians up? and and uh well first of all the there's 10 times more people down here than there is in Canada, right? Yes. There's more people in California than there is in all of Canada. Hold on. Hold, hold that thought. Hold that thought. I need to open a window because I'm getting really, really, really hot. Are you getting hot? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's crack a window. We're going to crack second. a window. Yeah. Yeah. He's cracking that window. Look at him go. Sliding door. Love it. <laughs> Talk about freedom. Being free to open a window. Yeah, Though I don't know if we're inviting. Um, I don't know if we're inviting other agents of nature to 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 feature in our podcast right now. Well, yeah, and we might hear some some local artists. Yeah, we know, might hear some. Local- <laughs> <laughs> we might hear GNL Zamba on his new Fender yeah. Stratocaster trying to nail out some notes. We could easily hear that kind of thing. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. But you're talking about Canada. Uh, uh, why we should keep the Canadians away from the US? <laughs> No, I was just saying that the that uh, Canada has a lot of support for the arts, mm-hmm. and there's grant there's a grant program that government money goes to to develop artists, goes to help people make records. Um, this the country is so big, and there's so few people that touring in Canada is pretty impractical. I mean, if you're gonna just drive it, it takes a long yeah, time, yeah, and sometimes yeah. you're driving like you know 15 hours to get to a city that only has 200,000 people, so. It's very, you know, it's it's very difficult to spread out a population that whole way and then still have a, a healthy touring art artist you know, yeah. situation. So okay. the government has put money aside to help subsidize that. So like, you know, the government will, um, if you get a grant, they'll say like, give you fifty cents on the dollar for your tour expenses, which literally makes that a, a viable option for a lot of artists that wouldn't have yes, the option yes, otherwise. Yes. Um, also, I think Canada is very cold. <laughs> and <laughs> as a result, there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time indoors in the winter. Yes. And when you're indoors yes. in the winter, you go insane if you don't have something uh, to work on, something creative to okay. do. I mean, okay. you can play, you can play games, you can do all kinds of things. But yes. there's a lot of, you know, so your, basement your, your, your cast is also your gift that you can hone your skills during winter. Sure. And when the t- sun comes out, you're the best guitarist. Yeah, and then yeah. the sun comes out, and there's festivals, and everyone's oh, excited, yeah. and yeah. everyone goes out, and and hopefully you've got a show together. Yeah. What's the suicide rate in Canada? I think it depends, but it's I don't know what the rate is exactly, but it's yeah. it's uh it's not nowhere and it's definitely higher the further north you go. 
Like the dark I bet. Yeah, the, 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 reason, the reason yeah. I asked is because I know Canada is a cold country and usually suicides are associated with cold places, people getting depressed and having few friends come over to visit and all these yeah, things. Yeah, seasonal depression is definitely a real thing. People, yeah. you know, in the winter it's so cold and then, you know, the sun goes down at 4 p.m. Yeah. So it's dark and cold and when you go outside you're in pain. <laughs> and because of that, maybe you're going to be a little bit less social. I don't. I can't believe. I. I. I'm not laughing because people are in pain and committing suicide. That's not what I'm trying to do. Yes. No, you're laughing at the ridiculousness of, li- oh, of yeah, living. Oh yeah, of there. like living there. Yeah. Like why? Why do people live like that? Yeah, and that's a question that the French had when when they um, when they eventually gave up on fighting the British to keep the colony their yes. colony. They said, "Why are we fighting over frozen land?" And they went home. <laughs> Like and everyone else stayed. They were like, they were like <laughs> fuck that. We're not doing yeah. that. We're not doing that right now. That's really impressive. Um, that's really dope, man. And so what do you think of that don't impress me much, Shania Twain? <laughs> <laughs> I, I find it quite impressive. She's, she's impressive? <laughs> it's I was, a pretty impressive song. I thought that was an American woman. Like for real, I was like really surprised to find out she was she was Canadian. No, that's the great thing about Canada. We, our accent is so similar. Yeah. We can sneak down here and no one knows. And I thought this whole entire time that Celine Dion, there's a radio station in Kampala that plays Celine Dion. When we were coming up, when we were young, um, it was Celine Dion in the morning, Celine Dion for, for Celine Dion for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Oh. And like all albums, they would like just pick a song to play all day and the, the radio station is called Capital FM. Shout out to Capital FM by the way. But <laughs> we hated Celine Dion so much but all of us knew the lyrics of each Celine Dion yeah, song. Like in, like you, you, you wanted to let everyone know that you weren't into it but yeah. deep down you knew you, the lyrics. You were moved a little bit. No, and you knew how to nail the note when it <laughs> came through, you know. <laughs> if you had to, to sing karaoke on that you could nail it. Yeah. 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 It's all coming back to me now. <laughs> Do you get it? <laughs> I, I, I sure do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so talking about, um, my God, there's, there's so much, like the gift from the gods, the point I was trying to make earlier yeah. about sound being like a gift from the gods, yeah. which was the very, very first word the Christians believe God said. Was that music is the gift from the gods? <laughs> no. <laughs> he said, let there be light, right? That means sound came before anything else. Did there, there be light? Did there be form? Did there be everything was commanded? Everything was commanded to existence, to form, right? Okay, yeah. And also, when you look at um, uh, when you vibe, when you put crystals of like souls on a piece of paper, and when you put crystal souls, on when a you piece put souls, souls, oh, souls, salt. souls, souls okay. on a piece of paper, yeah. And began vibrating or putting a speaker next to that, it would going to form a form, a different form with a, with a different. Um, it's going to it's going to make forms depending on what kind of frequency you're exposing it to, what kind of bump the, the speaker is giving it. Right. Right. Well, I don't know. Is that is that true or is that pseudoscience? That's not pseudoscience. That's fact. That's science fact. That's science fact. Are you sure? Like, if if I put crystals on this table and began um, playing music. If this table was was not this hard, uh-huh. and, and I put a speaker under this, yeah. right? Let's say this, if this was made of paper, right? And I put something under it to vibrate a certain frequency, uh, one song would form a different kind of shape with the salt or sand. Does it and do it every time the same shape? It wouldn't be the same shape. That's it. Wouldn't be the same shape. Like one song was going to give you something different because its bass resonance is going to be different from its highs or whatever. Right. So it's going to form different shapes in with every type of song. So in my mind, as a pseudo scientist, <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite kind of scientist. As as a real scientist, no, as a <laughs> thinker, because I, Einstein said that it's much more. Um, important. Your imagination is much more important than the shit that you already know. Einstein said that. Not that verbatim. A direct quote? Not verbatim. <laughs> <laughs> not verbatim. Your imagination is more important than the, the shit, shit you, you already, already know. know. Yes, I, y- Albert Einstein. Albert and Einstein. Albert Einstein. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Albert Einstein said the shit that the, your imagination is much more important than um, than the shit you already than know. Than the shit that you already know. I'm, not, I'm, I'm paraphrasing right now, but yes. Um, <laughs> To me, my imagination tells me that if I add A, B, and C, I could deduce D, right? 
If you add A, B, and C, you could deduce I could deduce D. D. I could come up with an answer for where D could be. Or a, a, hypoth- a hypothesis. You could guess D. Most of them, actually, most of the science is theorizing. So this is not new. What I'm doing is not, what I'm doing is not new. I'm, I'm, I'm the theorizing. My theory is, my sound theory is, yeah. that the way that uh, the Christians understood sound, they got that from the Egyptians, ancient Egyptians, who understood sound. And for creation to create all these forms, different forms, like your shape of a human is some kind of vibration that produced it. And what happens, uh, what does science tell us uh, happens when uh, a star is being created? There's a big bang, right? Yeah. And what's a bang? Isn't that a sound? It might be. A bang is a sound, don't a bang is a sound. When I do this, that's a sound, right? That's a bang. Yeah, bang is okay, a okay, sound. Okay, okay, let's okay. say when something explodes and creates that sound, it's a boom. It's a, whatever it is, it's a sound. Sure. And that means that it creates some kind of frequency that it sends into the atmosphere yeah. or that the, the particles that were part of the star that's dying right. are going to arrange themselves according to a certain kind of sound that, this, that, 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 that impacts upon it when it's in the air. Yeah. So the earth might have been formed according to the song of the universe. Mm. What happened during the Big Bang? It's not a far-fetched. Um, no, it's a beautiful. It's, be- yeah. it's beautifully sta- it's stated, and it, that's um, yeah. There's something magical about music. pseudoscience one on one. Yeah. Pseudoscience one on one. Well, there's also those other things, you know, those um, which also might be pseudoscience, but the idea that like. Cla- if you play classical music in the house for plants, they grow healthier. Than- oh, oh, oh! We proved that. Did you prove it? No, we didn't prove it. We didn't prove it. But my wife and I were in Austin, Texas. We were there for South by Southwest. And shout out to South by Southwest. Sa- shout out for, for, for the sponsorship. <laughs> you know, for uh, I'm playing. Mm. But we were we were down there, and um, they had an experiment. Not an experiment. How do I describe it? So it was a plant that responded to the stimulus of touch by okay. playing you a sound. Oh, interesting. So like every touch in every part of the plant gave you a different sound. Mm. So it was the stimulus was also, uh, you could hear the, the stimulus that your touch could translate into a sound. And depending on what part that you touch, it was the vibration enhanced from a plant. Mm, that's cool. You sound skeptical. No, I'm not skeptical at all. You're like, mm. I just, I'm, try, I'm, I think I'm having a little difficulty um, imagining that. Okay. okay. Um, this was a very wide, wide, um, wide-lived plant. Uh huh. And they had like sensors on it from the bottom. Okay. And every if you touch the stem, it would give you something different. If you touch the stem at the bottom, different sound. Oh, okay. Top, so, different sound. so the whole p- plant was wired with different sounds. No, the plant no. wasn't wired. The plant was had sensors. Had sensors on different parts. So that of it. your interaction with it would make a sound. Would make a sound. Okay. It would stimulate so it to make a sound. So you touch the plant and it'd go like ow. Yes. Or you touch the stem and it'd go <laughs> like, ah. Yeah. And then you could touch it and say, fuck off, like, depending on... Did you ever read any Roald Dahl short stories? I don't know what Roald Dahl is. Roald Dahl is the guy that wrote uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and James and the Giant Peach. I've, I haven't read any stories, but I think I know Charlie and the Chocolate Factory from yeah. Johnny Depp and yeah. the Oompa Loompas. Yeah, yeah. So he was, a, he was a British author and very, very, very odd and very, like, imaginative and creative. But he did some adult short stories, which I highly recommend because they're just really fun to read and... and and often just crazy ideas. Yeah. But one of them was this guy, the scientist who invented this machine he could put on. Mm-hmm. And, or, and it, um, it, could, it could essentially hear a whole bunch of frequencies that we can't hear and project them. And he went up onto his roof. Like a dog? Yeah, but like, yeah, higher frequencies that like dogs could hear that we can't hear, right? And so he goes onto his roof and he puts his headphones on so he can listen to these new things that humans have never been able to hear. And he keeps hearing the sound of like, Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> and he his looks neighbors? around and his neighbor is trimming the hedges and oh. he, s- he realizes that every time you know every time a plant gets cut that it it's, screams it's screaming and then and then and then there's a guy with a running a lawnmower behind and it just sounds terrible yeah <sighs> it's like a, it's like it's like a genocide of the yeah, grass yeah you, you know i'm weird like i have plants in the house uh-huh. and i'm weird that I believe some of my plants have feelings. Like if I water one 
and forget to water the other one. I imagine that one is becoming jealous of the other one. So I have to balance the relationship. I'm weird like that. Yeah, well, it's not, that's not, un, it doesn't seem like that's completely um, un, unfounded. The plants communicate with each other, mostly underground. Thank you. Yes. Uh-huh. There's like Keep, fungus that connect all yes, the forests, yes. right? And they've, they've noticed this, like, this is a relatively recent discovery. I think I heard about this on Radiolab. But essentially, there's a network of small fibers that are like mushrooms that connect each tree. And that's a way that uh, trees more efficiently get nutrients from the soil. And it, they've actually been observed to share. So as one, even one old tree in the forest, as it's dying, it will send its energy, its last bit of life for us, to the younger plants in the forest yeah. and feed them as it dies. And it'll even, wow. do it, it'll even do it with different types of plants, like plants that aren't the same species. Like have that, it's, it's like a wheel, like a tree like writes is a wheel and distributes its resources yeah, it's when it's like, dying. It's like the whole forest has like the internet under it and it's, the, it's these mushrooms. I think I've heard that, that, oh, that somewhere. And they're, they're managing... They're like going. They're like go, they're managing the resources of the forest. Is that sure uh, is that, is that the same thing? I think I read somewhere, or I was listening to uh, a news piece somewhere where they're talking about farmers in um, in uh, was I think it was Zimbabwe mm. where they're talking about how um, if one part of 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 the of the farm was sick, somehow the disease would be curtailed off and those plants would die. And save the rest of the other plants. That that there was some some plantary plant. I'm trying to look for the plant. The plants were communicating. Yeah. I guess with the internet that you're talking about, that they would inform the others that there is danger coming, and those ones would somehow kill the neighbors, or the neighbors would sacrifice themselves. Right. Or they, the fungus would cut, cut yes. off. The would connection cut off. To yes. It. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's amazing. There's so many things like that, like new discoveries. Yeah. That make your pseudoscience sound like it might be science I, fact you know d- d- now <laughs> nowadays nowadays I'm, that, nowadays i'm paying more attention to the things that i feel or that my mind imagines yeah. more than the things that the things that I, that i already discovered are just things to inform my imagination because i've seen so many things um, in recent years where imagination has fueled invention yeah. Th- speaking about um, how many things you've seen in film before they have been made that are now part of the th- things that, that we use every day. Like s- a cell phone was just imagined and someone put it, someone had a design, put it in a, put it in a movie even before the technology was ready. Right. And, it, and it fueled this, the, the, the passion of the scientists to make that a reality. That's interesting. Yes. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's just like Einstein said, you know. Yeah, whatever you imagine is more, more important, important than, than the what shit you already that you know. know. <laughs> the, the shit that <laughs> the you shit know. That you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. That's great. So, um, my other thing that I want to discuss with you is um, now that you know that there's that connection between the plants, right? Yeah. And you said that it's fungus, so it isn't like all of them are connected, or is the fungus an extension of the roots? As I understand it, the the uh, say like a tree grows and the trees, uh, the fungus sort of puts out a little like a sensor to say like, Hey, yeah. permission to come aboard. Yes. And then like, it's like the root system of the trees, like yes. you have permission granted. And the, it's, it's both ways. The, the tree can make sugar really easily, right? Through photosynthesis. Yes. So the tree gives the fungus, the sugar, but the fungus makes it, it transports all the micronutrients, all the minerals, mm. which the mm. root system of a tree is actually mm. not very good at getting. It doesn't get it very efficiently. Yeah. So this makes both parties happy. Um, so, so yeah. So the flow of the forest is more important than is as important as its, its roots. Sure. I mean, the roots are literally plugging into this network. Oh, okay, 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 okay. And the okay. network is going. You know, the network that's made of a different organism. Yes, that's like yes. you know, kind of one giant organism that that covers the whole forest floor is communicating I, I, with everything. In, in my mind, in my pseudoscience, I'm not. I'm. I'm going to stop calling it pseudoscience and and say, just say that I believe um, that even with humans, uh, much as you see, um, we are independent of each other. I believe there's an energy that we all share. And that the planet that we are living on is a breathing thing other than just something which is just dead. Rather than just a dead ball that possesses life floating around. Yeah. I believe it's a breathing thing too. And it's part of a breathing system that we haven't figured out yet. Well, there's one, there's one to, say, to say that the earth breathes is, 
is uh, sort of on a macro level is yeah. not that's not really pseudoscience at all. If you think about the fact that most of the land on mm-hmm. the planet is in the northern hemisphere, yes, uh, that means that most of the the land goes through a winter phase and a are summer you, phase. Are right? you saying that the land is is still inhaling? What I'm saying is, as what 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 did plants do? Plants breathe in carbon dioxide yes, and, and, and exhale oxygen. Oxygen, right? yeah. And if you look at the carbon di- a map of the carbon dioxide um, and oxygen in the world, it goes like there's a graph where it goes up and down yes, throughout the seasons. Yes, yes. So it really yes. is as if every year the entire Earth takes one big breath mm-hmm. and exhales one big time. Yeah, that that happens. Would be in danger if the Earth farted. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it does, right? Isn't that a v- volcanoes? Oh, that's that's like the Earth fart. Yeah. Those can be really dangerous, though. Yeah, th- th- those are really dangerous. You yeah, but those. I'm also looking at it like in the concept of like you're looking at the oxygen levels going up, and oh, I didn't understand the, what what you, what you meant by most of the land is the northern hemisphere. What so does yeah, that have so to most do with of everything? the plant life. Okay, so there's there's um obviously you know, there's a huge amount of oxygen that's created from phytoplankton, like in mm-hmm. the oceans, but a lot of the forests that are in the northern hemisphere, largely through Canada, Russia, all of these like really dense forests. They go through dormant periods in the winter yeah. where they're creating less oxygen. So yeah. it's like carbon dioxide levels just naturally rise a little bit in the atmosphere during that time. Mm-hmm. And then when the spring comes, all of those trees and all of those plant forms you know, spring into life and create a whole lot of oxygen. So on okay. a macro scale okay. around the globe, because yes. the entire northern hemisphere mm. with much mm. more land yes. has a lot more activity, yeah. there's a lot more oxygen. So it's kind of like all of the plants are breathing in and out once per year. Interesting. That's a very, very interesting thing. So when you look at the graph, it's like up and down because of those seasons. Yeah. Do the plants underwater use oxygen, use carbon dioxide as well? The pl- yeah. They, the planktons and whatever? Yeah. The, pl- the spinach? The spinach. The, what, the phytoplankton or the algae? Yeah, yeah. All I'm talking of about all the shit which the is same like mechanism. in the water. Yeah. 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 The craziest thing to think about with plants, I find, like if you look at a tree, and it's like really big. We always think... You think about it like, oh, it's grabbing stuff from the ground and building mm-hmm, itself. Mm-hmm. But it's not. It's, it's mostly carbon-based, right? It's carbon and water. And it's taking the carbon out of the air. Most of what it makes really a tree dope. a tree yeah. is actually coming out of the air. Like it's, they're, ma- so, they're growing themselves yes. out of thin that's, air. That's very, very interesting. Um, and and in, my, in my belief, that's also... Something which they, which which um, most people on Earth or the humans could take an example of, that it looks like we are being fed by only what we can see and mm. and eat. Mm. But what if what feeding us is out there somewhere in the sky, or it's an electromagnetic field that we can't see? Mm. So I looked at when 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 you say um, it's. It's the carbon dioxide that has already been proved. The blood absorbed all the carbon and blah, 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 give us oxygen. And the sun is also coming from the sky. But from the look of things, when you're just looking at it with our eyes, it looks like it must be grabbing a lot of shit from the ground, you know? Right, right. And absor- uh, absorbing it through like the water. And, okay, the water comes from the ground. Some plants also do it through osmosis on their leaves and stuff like that. But... You could think that the process is aided much more by the soil uh, than than the than the air. So for humans as well, the way that I look at it, it's no. I believe everything is balanced. Even as, even, even as I say that that there's a sky providing photosynthesis and aiding that other whole process of creating food. That there's a balance between what the ground provides and what the sky provides, mm. and what you can't see and what you can't see. But with humans, we're so convinced. And bent on the idea that it's just from the ground, and that's it. That's what feeds us. Right. Instead of looking at what could be spiritual, how we're dependent on the sun, how we're dependent on these other things in order for for us to survive. Right. We, we kind of think that the sun only feeds the plants that we eat, and that's it. But I believe the science is yet to discover more ways, yet to expand. On the research and discover new things that oh, it's constant. On. Every new discovery is is usually just another delightful way to understand, yes. to, to to see things. Every yeah. revelation. I mean, when I learned about the the network of fungus, that's crazy. Yes. Like there's the real evidence to suggest 
that you know that avatar or idea that there's this connected <laughs> yeah, tree yeah. that like talks to the whole yes, forest and it's yes, magical it's yes. like no that's true yeah i mean not, not exactly the way the film per, you know portrays but yeah. something I like love that, that film. Is true. i love that film by the way i <sighs> me too I used to think that if you don't love that film, yeah. you're not going to be a happy person. But when I was watching that that film, to me, I, I I looked at it as I don't know if it was the writer's intention, but it looked to me like it was the way Europe colonized <laughs> yeah. Africa. I never yeah. understood what the southern whole shit was for. It yeah. was mainly for let's get the diamonds out. Right. Let, let's get to the minerals. But they they portrayed. I feel like they portrayed it, like yeah. There was there was still like you know the, the the, the like sort of the John Smith character who like, you know who like figured out how to make you know how to make it with the natives and like you know yes yes. W- but yes. I don't think that film in any way sort of glorified the colonists. It, it was no no like, no. It did not. Actually, yeah. it did not. It made me it made me feel as sad that what they were trying to get to was destroying what should be preserved right, you know right. and it kind of made me feel sad it made me feel actually really 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 sad i need to watch avatar again they're making a second one i think so yeah uh so yeah shout us to our homie james cameron <laughs> we really <laughs> like your shout we, out we, james cameron sh- shout out cameron man so let's i think we're like we should probably wrap this up what do you think uh, we should we should wrap it up. I'm I'm still enjoying the conversation. Um, I am too, but I think we can do many more. We can do so so many more, and I need to refill my drink right now. Thank you for hanging out with us. Uh, this is the Zambaland podcast, Mind Over Matter, and I'm with Ben Wilkins. Shout outs to um, our team that's making sure that the sound is fine and that the pictures are pictures are reaching you uh, in crisp, clear test. High definition. Uh, in the, uh, this episode, we just decided to go free flowing, right? Right, right. And uh, free flow, I think, is the way of the universe. And we're talking about how the universe breathes. Breathes or is it breathes? Breathes. Uh, how the universe breathes. Yes, <laughs> we're talking about that. And, and the concept that, the point that I forgot to make as in, uh, in final conclusion in my um, end notes, I should say, the, there's this concept that the universe is expanding right yeah and for for a while it has been expanding and if you're an insect you don't realize how far it is expanding or you don't even realize an an insect and an elephant i think experience time at a very different in a very different way right because of the scale of their bodies and their understanding we don't know the truth is we have no idea. we don't know but 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 we can deduce that like if we can assume it like you could look at an insect and think like oh this is probably like a pr- you know primitive software. It's yeah. like oh, see this thing and do this. It's probably but the, but the, when the, actual yeah. fact is we have no idea what an insect might think. Let's let's or let's how it might think. Let's let's uh, let, let 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 me give you an example. Okay, we're still trying to wrap if, this up. Here. We're still trying to wrap <laughs> this up. But <laughs> if you are walking from from West Hollywood yeah to the Hollywood Bowl yeah and you say oh that might be take me about thirty minutes right. How would an insect, how long do you think it would take an insect to walk from here to the Hollywood Bowl if it took you 30 minutes? Depends on which insect, I think. I, I think, let's say, let, it's safe to say, let's say, a praying mantis. Praying mantis? I think we're talking a couple of days, a good solid few days. It might be, a, it, it might think 30 years. It might think 30 years. It might think 30 years. Okay, but depending on scale, you, you see the point that I'm trying to make. Yeah. We might be experiencing time at a very different um, way, but... That is not even that's even besides the point that I was trying to make. That if the, I, the our universe is expanding, right. right? What if it's just breathing, and this is just it? Uh, when you exhale, it con- the lungs contract, right? When you exhale, and when you inhale, contract. they expand, right? right? That's right, right. So maybe we're still inhaling, and it appears that we are. Um, maybe it's going to sneeze. Expanding. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for hanging out with us. It's your boy GNL Zamba, the Zambaland podcast, Mind Over Matter, with Ben Wilkins, uh, my okay. swimming instructor, the surf god and uh, <laughs> producer, uh, sound enthusiast and friend. And I'm your boy GNL Zamba from Uganda, the Caesar. Thank you for hanging out with us. Catch us next time on the podcast. And whatever that you're thinking about, I want you to remember one thing if I'm to leave you with one thing. Your imagination is much more important than the shit you already know. Peace and love.
Chanel Samba Baboon Force A legend <laughs> 